my pleasure to turn the floor over to our first speaker today, Jessica Unger. Great, thank you so much, Adam. And we're so happy that you're all joining us here today. Hello, everyone. I'm Jessica, and I'm with Heritage Preservation. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to the online community, and then we'll move on from there. The Connecting to Collections online community was originally created in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The community and webinars are moderated by Heritage Preservation and Learning Times is kind enough to produce both our website and webinars. The goal of the online community has always been to help smaller museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies quickly locate reliable preservation resources and network with colleagues. To help you do that, we have compiled an extensive list of online resources that are broken up by topic on the online community. In addition, we also hold free drop-in webinars, like the one today, on topics we hope you'll find useful. A recording of all of our webinars, including this one, can be found under webinar archives. And of course, if you're interested in continuing the discussion, you're welcome to sign up as a member of the community and post questions on the discussion board. Today I'm pleased to welcome Amanda Eisman and Ryan Edge. Amanda has an MA and PhD in Early Modern History from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. She is currently working at the University of Illinois' Preservation and Conservation Lab on the Preservation Self-Assessment Project while she finishes up an MLS with specializations in data curation and special collections. Ryan Edge is the project manager of the Preservation Self-Assessment Program and a Preservation Conservation staff member at the University of Illinois Libraries. He holds a Master's of Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And later this winter, he'll be joining Michigan State University Library as their media preservationist. He also wants everyone here to know that he has a long and rich history of volunteer work at museums. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pull over our presenters presentation for today. And um, say to, say, Amanda and Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. And I just want to remind folks as well that if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in the chat box, and then we'll make sure to get to them before the end of the hour. All right, with that, Ryan and Amanda, hand it over to you. All right, hello. So I'll be talking about PSEP today, the Preservation Self-Assessment Program. And uh, I first wanted to say that I was so excited to see so many people here, people from all over. And um, as a Georgian, uh, hello to my fellow Southerners. There seem to be quite a number of you. Um, but so there. Uh, so let's talk about PSEP, shall we? So as cited in the 2005 Heritage Health Index report, there were an estimated 1.7 billion books in bound volumes, 52 million unbound paper items, and 727.4 million photographic images trusted to the care of our cultural heritage institutions. Of these, 65% of collecting institutions have collections damaged by improper storage. 40% of institutions don't have any funds to allocate for preservation or conservation. Giving a more specific illustration of the situations that give rise to preservation and conservation disasters, the 2009 Illinois Connecting to Collection Survey of Preservation Need in nearly 300 libraries, archives, museums, and historical societies showed that 39% have not had a general conditions or collection survey, 42% are without adequate humidity control, 34% uh, percent without light control, 37 percent do not have a disaster plan, 58 percent do not have disaster training even, 59 percent do not have a conservation plan, and 40 percent do not have adequate security. And of course, these are all issues um, for long-term well-being of our collections. So what's the role of assessment? Well, there's a number of areas to be concerned about in the realm of collection preservation and conservation. Assessment is about much more than just surveying and evaluating items in our collections. Institutional policies and procedures influence how well and how often assessment is carried out. 
This can kind of go down to things like levels of access, use, and supervision. These things all help maintain both individual items and collections conditions. So being aware of environmental factors and maintaining regular monitoring practices can help prevent damage from occurring and to identify problems before they get worse and do more damage. Being prepared for what to do to preserve and protect collections in the case of disaster preparedness and knowing what preemptive measures to take. Um, and kind of the final major role of assessment is knowing and providing the best storage situation for individual formats. So what are the costs of an action of um, not being able to assess or not having our collections assessed? So unassessed and underassessed collections are a problem in terms of um, said conservation, preservation of cultural assets and heritage objects. So it's a problem for um, libraries, archives, museums, all of us. Performing assessments allow one to understand the overall preservation needs of a collection and to predict exact needs and costs of taking action to preserve items or collections. So unpreventable damage needs to be anticipated and planned for things that have material inherent vices. You can see this show up um, with CD shedding, um, optical disc decomposition, nitrate film deterioration, uh, brittle paper. Um, you also see this in red rotted leather. Um, other unpreventable damage uh, kind of falls into the category of general wear and tear. So chipped edges, ripped pages, broken spines, um, weak sewing, fingerprints, and other deposits on CDs and other optical kind of vinyl media. So things that may have been clean or that um, would take quite a lot of effort to clean off. So then we've got the category of kind of preventable damages. So other types of damage can be avoided and mediated somewhat by improving display practices, setting a uniform emergency and disaster policies, and establishing best practices for handling and access. So I'm talking a little too fast, okay. Um, so we've talked about, um, there's, this is a webinar and there's a number of other ones. So there's actually one uh, about book preservation and I think it, maybe y'all should check that out. It was, it was quite a good one. And it um, discusses many issues involving books, like just how you store them on the shelf even. So damage can be um, reduced by planning ahead and um, kind of setting things up so that you're done right the first, the first kind of way. Um, and then also by estimating storage costs over the long term and not simply solving things in the short term. So poor storage methods would be um, being concerned about the individual's object exterior. So if you did not use dust covers at all, um, you just had weak binding and you didn't kind of get a sturdy binding or something. Um, not using clamshell cases to, to protect materials. And as I was saying, you can also see this with shelving. Um, how best to stack and organize books on the shelf so that uh, all sizes, large and small, aren't right next to each other and influencing um, how well each of them lasts. Um, you can see this with storage of open reel audio films without boxes. Um, you can see this with vinyl stored without protective enclosures. So it's not just for books. In terms of environmental uh, dangers, um, these can lurk in the peripheries, so you may not really think of them right offhand, um, but uh, they're always kind of maybe watched out for. These kind of things include mold, water damage, um, insects and rodents. Uh, so beetles, silverfish, bookworms, roaches, mice, also even dogs. Uh, people return things and their dog got at it. So uh, sun and exposure damage, and this is true for books, films, negatives, old photographic plates. This can have long-term damage. Um, no and poor circulation in your archives or, or around your materials. Uh, and things like I mean, fluctuating temperatures and humidity, which can cause bindings and material to warp. This brings us to a forest of formats. So adding to the problem, collections are always growing and developing. And of course, technology is always evolving. This makes it hard for collecting institutions to identify particularly new or outdated formats, as well as to keep track of the best practices for formats preservation and conservation. Over the last century, media formats have widely and wildly expanded. Since 1987, 
over 17 new digital videotape formats have been put out. Just like with analog tapes, of which there are many, many types, each of these formats has brought with it new preservation and access concerns. Um, there's numerous other uncontrollable factors influencing this explosion of new and or changing old formats that collecting institutions need to know all about and be on top of if they want to preserve their collections. Uh, kind of these factors can include fluctuating cost in production of materials, um, the fact that uh, the kind of global distribution of materials now, so you have to kind of be concerned with what's going on with production and manufacturers in other countries as well as in the United States. National and global legal copyright restrictions, proprietary software and technology, and the ever shorter lifespan of digital media formats. So there are numerous organizations set up to track and document all the new specifications, but even they can't keep up. So for example, the UK's registry for digital formats, PRONOM, doesn't have its PUID, its identifier, kind of little tag for some formats and subtypes and compression algorithms yet. So if the main thing which uh, kind of the main place to go doesn't even have these things, then it's, you can't be expected to know them all either. And of course, if they don't even have it, then that makes it that much more difficult for you to know more about it. Then we have the issue of unearthed collections. So I've kind of got four different little movies up here. Look at those by. Talking. So over the last five years, a number of large collections of old media formats have been discovered and are still in the process of being documented. So it's not even just all these new formats, it's also a bunch of old ones keep sprung back out of nowhere. So overseas archives, and um, th th this has happened in New Zealand, Australia, Amsterdam, you know, the Netherlands, uh, Italy. They've discovered hundreds of previously undocumented nitrate films from the 1920s that were either believed to have been destroyed at the time or that no longer had surviving documentation. So some examples here, the bashful bigamist, um, the girl stage driver, the diver, and China and the Chinese. And you can kind of see from these examples, um, it's not just uh, feature films. Some of these are, are films that uh, have a lot of historical use too, like China and the Chinese. Uh, that could be a rather useful primary historical source just for historians, um, let alone um, film, real studying film. So for collecting institutions, this means not only is there more to know in terms of what's out there, but also there's ever more to learn about preserving, even about the materials that one already had, already knew about. So finds like this means that a conservator can better, now that we had this body of work, it means that a conservator can ultimately better decide how best to preserve objects in a particular format because there's a sizable body of that format to kind of use as good context. So in some cases, this can help the conservator know if the decay on one or two objects in the collection were indicative of the individual object's deterioration, or if the deterioration was characteristic for that format's material composition or manufacturer. So if the manufacturer didn't do a good job, then that's maybe why the film's not doing well, because you can see 10 other examples of the exact same thing happening in totally different types of films, but all done by the same manufacturer. Assessment in smaller institutions, and uh, we're, PSAP is designed for smaller institutions. So collection assessment is one of the basic tasks that um, small organizations need to perform, and yet they rarely have the resources to be able to do so. Pretty much of all organizations, they are the, the ones that cannot afford to do so. Uh, assessments usually involve a fair amount of time, money, and task to task dedicated staff. Um, assessment is usually involved on-site specialists or experts hired to come in. And uh, you can see it's with Heritage's uh, CAP program. Um, so these aren't necessarily negatives. It's just uh, they're kind of things why sometimes it's hard for small organizations to be able to get to assessment. Assessment for on-site on -site work has involved training people. And this involves paying for and sending staff away for training. Uh, an assessment of any type of collection needed to be done by area specialists. Um, so this is in some parts why some collections have been done or assessed properly because they didn't have the right specialist to help them out. So what is the PSAP? I've been talking for a while and maybe you're wondering, what is the PSAP? 
So it is a um, preservation assessment web application. It's kind of set up a series of different questions, no more than 20 questions maximum, and it doesn't really rely on the model of you inputting tons and tons of data. Um, it's more like a questionnaire, so kind of a simple, intuitive survey tool. In addition, uh, there's an instructive guide. Um, there's a number of supplemental institutional resources. And also, it's a generator of metadata and administrative records. So it's kind of a whole bunch of things all wrapped into one. So kind of everything you need in one place. So um, you might have seen some other assessment tools. So you're kind of figuring out, well, what does PSAP give me that the other things don't? All right. Well, um, it's free. It doesn't require special hardware, software, or any particular specifications for your computer. Nothing has to be installed or updated. Um, there's no training required to use it. It doesn't require expert technical knowledge in any area. If you have it, that is great, but it doesn't expect you to. Uh, it allows for some ambiguity in assessment, so there's options like, I'm not sure if you're asked what type of format something is. Uh, it's designed to scale with different platforms and devices, particularly with mobile phones and tablets. So um, when we're saying computer, that could actually mean a number of different devices, not just, uh, say, your desktop. Compared to other uh, assessment tools, PSAP has a customizable form. So one can set certain objects as high or low priority. One can chase, uh, track changes over time and make adjustments for preservation planning based on that. It stores information for you so you don't need to put your, any resources towards that, I mean, money of your own or just space on your computer. It offers item and collection level assessments. Uh, it, it generates metadata for records without requiring user knowledge of those metadata schemas. And it publishes online, so it's easy to keep track of changes made to records and collections. So um, what kind of formats and materials does it cover? That might seem to be rather relevant, right? Well, it covers quite a lot. So let me give you some examples. For video films and discs, this is, this is just some of them. Be Betamax, laser disc, Super 8 film reels, two-inch open reel videotapes, uh, pretty much just a lot of different sizes of open reel videotapes. Uh, audio recordings, we've got wire, um, quarter-inch reels, which is kind of what you use for radio usage. Acetate, um, and this quarter inch reels, and we're talking about all different types of materials. So acetate, PVC, paper, polyester, um, DATs, wax phonograph cylinders, phonograph records, and not just the vinyl records, but also aluminum, shellac, and lacquer. We cover CDs, just your general audio CDs. And I've got stuff in photography. So you've got microfilm, microfiche. And that's the acetate, nitrate, polyester types of it. Uh, Polaroid instant photos, glass cyanotypes, daguerreotypes. As far as books, we cover tawed vellum with wood boards even. So not just the vellum by itself, but with wood boards. A limp vellum, Japanese side stitch, full paper binding with embossed linen, uh, adhesive bindings with staples. So kind of all different types of forms that you might see. Punch and bind scrapbooks with side lacing, comb bound church cookbooks postbound manuscripts. And uh, we also cover things that may seem like they're straightforward uh, until you actually need to preserve them and then you realize, oh my, there's, there's much more to it. So we've got color photo, uh, photocopies, things that you might see in an office, diffusion transfer, thermofaxes. Um, also we do architectural drawings and um, sources like maps. So pretty much every type of material that uh, most archives and libraries and uh, at least some parts of museums will be running into. So I've got a little screenshot from it. Um, so PSAP as a resource. Um, PSAP confronts head-on the question of where do we go to begin to prioritize care and treatment. This tool is largely about instilling confidence in the idea that doing something is better than doing nothing. And that something can be defined here and performed with confidence, knowing that the logic is objective-based and produces metrics for informed preservation decisions. 
Chinasen, PSTAT provides a number of supplemental assessment materials to accompany the web assessment application. And I'll get into kind of over these. We'll uh, kind of get into some materials, so I'll show you the cheat sheets and, and whatnot. Let's see. So let's get to the first one. All right, material construction and format. So when we're talking materials, yeah, we mean like plastic adhesives. We have a whole section on adhesives. So plastic transparencies even. Um, this kind of gives you an idea. We've got we, um, pictures are very important they, for the entire guide, for the whole tool. So picture here and then different sections, kind of things broken down into useful information. Another supplemental thing would be the identification sheet. So this is kind of, um, you have this kind of as a resource just with you real quick. There's a bunch of different pictures, so you can kind of see here. This is what a photostat is, quick dates on it, a uh, quick little bit of information. And here's the next thing, which looks totally different from it, some dates on it. So if you're trying to identify something, you can kind of just go through these identification sheets real quick and go, uh, OK, no, this one, this one. So um, before we move into the details of assessment, this is probably a good time to mention that uh, there's what I call a handout, but it will be on, on the uh, webinar website. Um, and it will have a number of useful assessment and preservation focused resources. So please don't forget to look over that, that sheet after my talk. So back to this. Assessments are more than just surveys. So. Um, assessments must evaluate the policies, practices, conditions in an institution that affect the preservation of all the collections. They need to address the general state of all the collections, like what is needed to improve that state and how to preserve the collections in the long term. Assessments also need to identify specific preservation needs, rec uh, rec <laughs> recommend actions to meet those needs, and prioritize the recommended actions. In terms of condition assessment, um, this is designed to identify the physical condition of the collection in a specific manner, often combining observations on damage and deterioration with incident and type and frequency of use. An action survey would uh, express the preservation needs of a collection in terms of actions that will secure, replace, protect, or treat the items examined. So one of the other tools here is um, the glossary. So as I was saying, this is kind of all things you want all together. So um, it's just an additional resource. You've already done your assessment, but you're thinking about something in your collection. You can just go to our glossary, look something up real quick, done. And again, as a resource, so you'd like to know more. You would like to educate yourself or there's someone in your staff that um, you think they could benefit from learning some more on um, conservation preservation assessment. Project bibliography has plenty of things. It's broken up into material types. Um, basically, it just breaks down in a lot of different ways and gives you a number of different resources to help you out there and to learn more. And thus we've reached the format ID guide. So this is um, this guide can actually stand on itself. The others are, are supplemental resources, um, but this is meant to, to be an independent thing as well. The format ID guide is a dynamic and media-rich decision tree that allows users various methods to assess their collections, um, so they can kind of pursue the most appropriate flavor of preservation assessment. As I said, it's intended to be a standalone reference work that can be used independently of PSAT's web application. Uh, the Format ID Guide provides multiple images for each media format discussed and gives detailed advice for material and format preservation. It offers high resolution images like retina scans, microscopic views, and demonstrational videos. Um, and that's videos that demonstrate like kind of different the, the sheen on the surface of something. Um, kind of demonstrate various things, practical things that you might want to know or need to know as additional support. 
And all this um, serves to narrow the field of selection and provide users with more accurate targeted scoring. So, who can use the Peace app? Maybe free and all this other wonderful stuff, but um, is it really just anyone? Yes, pretty much. Anyone with a computer access. And as I said, computer here means desktop, laptop, tablet, mobile phone. Anyone with music can be specialists, students, volunteers. Anyone at your institution, pretty much. And what institution is that? Pretty much anyone. Um, libraries, archives, museums, historical and other cultural heritage, heritage institutions. Uh, I see that Ryan's already been talking a little bit in the side there about the, the structure of the assessment, so maybe this will help answer some of those questions. Um, so here's kind of the structure of PSAP. It starts at the top, at the institutional level, and uh, begins as a fast, modular, top-down profile building. So we go into institutions, so we're thinking organizations and repositories. Set up at this level only needs to be done once. So you set it and forget it. The data will be stored for you whenever you want to return. The locations here, you can store information on as many storage or exhibit spaces as you have. And resources, and then notice this is both the item and collection. You can enter your resources to be assessed as individual items and through collection sample surveys. You can also enter resources as both um, items and collection surveys for the same locations. Looking a little closer at the institutional level assessment. Here's a screenshot. And um, things here involve preservation planning, um, levels of access, so who can check it out, who can access it, under what constriction or conditions or restrictions can one use it, um, does one need to observe special handling procedures before accessing it. Uh, mark the security of collections and security of individual items, uh, notes about material inspection, and you can kind of uh, register whether or not you have a disaster recovery plan set in place. So location level, uh, this would include considerations of different buildings and repositories, storage spaces, warehouses, exhibition locations. So when we say locations, it can be kind of broad range of places you may actually have stuff. Environmental factors here and monitoring is important. Um, so again, this was temperature, got the humidity, light, pests. Can include things like um, off-gassing or things that are being housed near other items or collections that produce toxic and material damaging conditions. And this is the area we would also note things about emergency preparedness. So do you have a plan for where you might need to temporarily store books if there's an emergency, either for protection or for triage? So at the uh, item collection level, this is based on a format. So there's a base score given per format type. Then there's factors of environment, so the location it's in. Um, it's used in access, so how it's used and how frequently. Storage and container, so how has it been stored? What has it been stored in or on? And it's the physical condition. So after you go through all the work of setting up your account and answer questions, you'll be rewarded with an assessment report. So the assessment reports include a preservation queue, areas of improvement, institutional score, location score, item collection score, and then collection statistics. And this kind of gives you a more screenshots, a better kind of view of how that, what you would see when we say report here. So I've mentioned uh, metadata before, and um, this is kind of one of the things that uh, PSAP generates, a little bonus side thing. So metadata is machine-readable information about other information, uh, where this information this information that's been transmitted describes any aspect about any type of resource, object, abstract concept, or data. 
By generating metadata records for one's holdings, it makes it easier for information, such as finding aids, um, and resources and collections to be shared within and between institutions. For a small organization, this can be a very valuable way to both to advertise one's holdings to a wider body of potential users and to work collaboratively with other possibly local cultural heritage institutions and agencies. Coming up with ways to produce and store metadata is also very important to the long-term access and preservation of analog objects, um, recording provenance and copyright licensing information, for example, um, storing information about related components, records, information for exhibitions, so for museums, such as how exactly art installations should be stored and re exhibited in the future, and what things are negotiable on that front or what aren't, particularly when we're talking about um, digital material that uh, Maybe that, that um, you don't have the equipment anymore to play it. So this is for analog objects as well as born digital materials. And born digital could be audio, visual, text, research data sets. As many of you may already know, many new grants, and this is NSF, NEH, now contain a requirement that data produced through federal funding must be made available to the public for free and must be stored on long-term dedicated servers. So as a result, institutions that previously did not have time resources, training, or you know, perhaps a desire to produce metadata records for their holdings are now being forced to do so. So that may be some of y'all, and you may be wondering how on earth they're going to even start on this. But fortunately for these institutions, PSAP has an additional feature that integrates EAD, and that's encoded archival description, metadata with the data it gathers through the assessment process. PSAP then allows one to edit and export uh, records metadata. So as you can see here, it imports the EAD files to add new data to them. Uh, you can generate, edit, and export metadata easily as both EAD and um, Dublin Core for both individual and bulk records. You can export data as a CSV, making the data integrate well with many AMS CMSs. So, for example, it's compatible with Archive Space. Um, if you're interested in seeing how metadata schemas compare to other, the um, Library of Congress has maps and style sheets for crosswalking metadata into other schemes. So we have EAD and DC. There's also things out there to help you convert them to if, you're, if your institution already has a metadata scheme that's not, say, DC. Um, it should be pretty much no problem to at least crosswalk some metadata. And uh, you can um, talk about other schemas like uh, CWA, ERA Core, PD Core, Premise, Met, Smart 21. And uh, if you look at the handout, it's got a whole section on metadata. So uh, kind of. If you want to learn more or maybe want to figure out how to do the crosswalking, there should be resources there. OK. Um, and that just gets us kind of towards the end. So what will PSIP help, help you to do? Well, um, it will help you assess an object you've never seen before and don't even know how to begin researching. Uh, it will help you assess a collection with mixed materials in one place. So if you've got AV and paper, that's no problem. Uh, if you're assessing new materials for preservation needs, for any preservation needs at the time of accessioning, assess and create records for a collection in need of preservation conservation. I'm just reading it down here. Assess collections to update conservation knowledge and improve institutional practice. So this is one of the things we have the supplemental resources for if you just keep going back uh, if you're interested, or just, just your own curiosity, or if you get a new item in and you just need to know what to do with it, come over to us. Uh, and also to help you uh, assess your collection for grant purposes, for example, Heritage's CAP program. Um, so, uh, we've just entered the testing phase of development, so we're really eager to get any type of feedback we can from everyday practitioners like y'all. Um, about the tool. So please let us know what you think about PSAP and how you think you might be able to make it better serve the preservation and conservation community. I'll be on the Connecting to Collections forum. I'll be more than glad to answer any additional questions there or by email. My email address is eisemann -E at illinois.edu. So thank you very much. Uh, let's see if we can get to some questions here. Great, thank you so much, Amanda. I'm just going to go ahead and, and jump in here at this point. This is Jessica again, Heritage Preservation. Um, early on, we had a question from 
Robert at Fort Mill, wondering if there's any cumulative stats about the loss of archival material due to failure to plan um, for disasters. And um, Robert, I can address that question on behalf of the um, Heritage Health Index report of 2004. Um, we know that 41% of collections at archives are around 149 million items were at risk because institutions do not have emergency plans in place. And uh, we're doing actually a follow-up survey this year um, titled the Heritage Health Information 2014 Survey. So hopefully we'll have some new numbers coming out soon that will show us what's happened in terms of disaster planning within the last decade. Um, Amanda and Ryan, I invite you both to jump in at this point. Um, Ryan's been doing an excellent job at uh, addressing some of the questions that have been popping up in our chat window. Um, but I think it would be great if we could possibly even go over some of those again um, out loud for everyone here in the webinar. And if anyone else has other questions, feel free to go ahead and type them up in the chat box and we'll get to them before the top of the hour. Great. So Amanda and Ryan, do you want to jump in? Hi everybody, this is Ryan. Um, yeah, I've, I've been trying to answer most of the questions that come up, but I've been informed that I should probably leave a few um, that that everybody would like to hear. So let me just open this up. So the question is, temperature and relative humidity entries are based on an annual average. Is that true? Um, also, is there an entry to enter time-weighted preservation Oh, that last part. <laughs> TWPI value, um, Robert, yes, index. Time-weighted preservation index value. Um, we don't currently um, support TWPI value input, um, but I do think that that would, be, that would be a very welcome addition to the program. Um, so, Yes, we actually do ask a question about the annual fluctuation of, um, of temperature and relative humidity in the environment, but we also give users an out, um, especially in instances where they might be placing or storing items or exhibiting items in locations that don't have, say, um, an HVAC system that gives them a, a, a pulse on that. Um, so we allow quite a bit of um, of a gray zone there, and it does impact the score. But um, yeah, hope that answers the question. And let me see. Okay, is there a way to do a spot preservation assessment? For example, for a collection of 10,000 photographs, could you get a score for every fifth item entered? Yes, Jennifer, that's actually, um, that is how the collection and could be thought of as sub-collection or spot preservation assessment um, component is designed that we kind of lead you by the hand through a um, statistically valid um, preservation survey, a uh, random sample survey of a collection. Or you could choose to make it a little less random and choose items based on some curatorial concern. And then, as Amanda mentioned earlier, um, there will be um, statistics and infographics that explain just, um, you know, the margin of error that you can expect in that and um, how all of the uh, hierarchy I mean, all of the hierarchy of the location and the institution impact the collection as a whole. <laughs> um, is this down? Oh, I might go back up to the top of the questions real quick. I think there's another one. Is is the information collected in the assessment publicly shared? It is not um, going to be publicly accessible. You do have the option to choose other users at your organization to share um, this, this information with, though. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm glad that you have 
that concern, that you're sharing that concern, because this was something that we went back and forth about, was just how watertight this really needed to be in terms of uh, information security. But I really do think that um, to give everyone the freedom to to really go for it and be honest in assessments, because I think that there is a lot of shame attached with um, uh, a poor storage facility or um, a, a collection that's just naturally deteriorated to the the point of some of those that we showed earlier. So, um, is there a way to add attachments to your assessment, namely a graph of environmental data over time or the layout of a room? Oh, that is that is not something that we currently have facilitated in the program because um, I there was some early discussion of that, but because we don't know how many users to anticipate truly, um, and we are going to be hosting all of the information securely here on University of Illinois servers, um, once we kind of open it up to um, uh, kind of a Dropbox for graphics, images, other folders like that, um, we, we might be pushing our, our limits here. But um, that's not to say that we might uh, reassess that later on and, and decide to uh, include an attachments option. But we do have a uh, number of notes fields. And you can expand, I think, up to like 12 different notes fields um, as you are kind of fleshing out a um, collection or item. And you can include uh, hyperlinks to uh, online information, or if you have some sort of uh, collection management system, you can uh, cross-link. So. And next question, what do you recommend for an institution that does not have an environmental control and is located in a hot and humid climate? Um, we do actually have um, a, we have a environmental guidelines uh, document that is presently available online in the uh, format ID guide under supplementary documents. And uh, members of our advisory committee, uh, it's a, a broad uh, schmear of library, archives, historical society folks uh, represented on that, um, uh, actually worked with us to, to craft these uh, recommendations. And we have um, a bibliography for all of this as well as uh, resources for each individual document. So if you have questions or if you want to take it a little bit further and learn more than what we cover, um, it's, it's all there in the bibliography. Um, we are conducting a move slash inventory of our archive and book collection in... Okay. Do you, do you maybe want to answer that question real quick? I'll jump off mic and I'll uh, I'll throw over to Amanda real quick. Well, I think you can probably just read my response. But uh, yeah, we're, since we're doing testing, several kind of rounds of testing over the next several months, um, if anyone's interested in trying to, to get in on that, um, why don't you send me an email and we can uh, talk about it. Um, so that will take place over for the next several months, and there's another question when it should be officially done, and by May, I, I think all the testing and everything should definitely be done by May, so. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, so it'll be live by March, early April. Right, um, we just need to keep tweaking things. And this is Jessica again. I'm just going to jump in quickly because I'm seeing that we're um, coming close to the top of the hour. And I just wanted to go ahead and pull over an evaluation um, link here. Um, we would really appreciate your input if you have the time to go ahead and give us some feedback on uh, this program today. And we really look at your responses closely and use it to shape our future events. So hopefully this isn't blocking too much of our, our final slide here. But if you all have the opportunity later on today to, to jump over there and give us some feedback on the program, that would be great. Um, please go ahead and keep your questions coming. Um, we're going to try and get to as many of them as we can before 
we get to the top of the hour, but thank you so much to Amanda and Ryan for um, all of your, your great responses so far. And just um, remember everyone that if you have additional questions that you think of after the program's over, um, Amanda and Ryan have listed their contact information um, here on this final slide. So be sure to um, either reach out to them or um, continue the conversation on the C2C forums. And I know we're all really excited to see uh, this, this program come live in the coming months. So with that, um, if there's any other questions, feel free to keep them coming. Uh, so I saw the question about will this uh, interface with the past perfect database. Um, I'm afraid it not. Um, except it's compatible with some things um, like archive space, but um, yeah, unfortunately it's not directly compatible with the past perfect. Is that uh, all the questions, or am I missing some other ones? There have been so many, which is great. Uh, I don't want to miss something. Uh. Um, so there was a question about um, what to do in an institution that you're serving that's never done an assessment. Um, in order to have the funds to hire consultants. That's kind of the, the concept of the PSAP, which is you can do use this tool. Um, if you're starting to say, what can we do now before the tool goes live in March and April, if you look at my handout, there are some uh, kind of suggestions, some partial solutions to the problem. Um, but um, as far as how to do it all, that, that kind of is what we do. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty much exactly the situation. You've never had an assessment. You don't have the funds to hire consultants. What do you do? Well, we've got a tool. You don't need funds. It's free, and you don't need particular skills to. Do it. You don't need a, an expertise in all the material types, um, and um, you can pretty much set up anyone to help you do it. So if you've never done an assessment before, that's fine, and we'll just kind of basically walk you through it. Hmm. Sample. Sam oh, there's a question about the sample metadata. Hmm. Um, there was a question about the availability of sample metadata to test compatibility with other systems. Um, yes, um, Jamie, we can. If you want to contact me. Um, Privately, and I'll just go ahead and um, you could use the PSAP at library.illinois.edu email and um, just hit me up right after this. And um, I do think that we actually have some samples on deck for um, for EAD XML and Dublin Core um, XML, and uh, we also just have a. a CSV comma separated value um, output so you can export all of your institutional information if you want to walk away from the program at some point if it's not right for you the information that you put into the program will not be in vain it won't just be lost in the ether you can export it and uh, and it's readable with Microsoft Excel so um, that's an option too uh, but do, yeah, do contact us um, today or next week, and uh, we can share those with you. And another question, can you share it 
to then pass with pass on to other end users. Um, yeah, you you could ask someone um, at your organization to set up a login to the program. That's one way of doing it, um, and then you could share your information with them that way, and that would probably be the most immersive way. But we also um, allow the export of PDFs if you just want to give them the report. Let's say if you are trying to talk to an administrator or if you are applying for a grant, uh, a preservation assistance grant, then um, and again, there are people on our advisory committee that helped us to design it this way so that we kind of hit all the metrics that are, are very um, commonly asked for in these, um, in these grant applications and proposals. Um, you can share it that way. You can share it to the most high-tech and low-tech um, of, uh, of, of folks that you need to share the information with. Um, can you recommend what to do if the institution that you are serving never has done an assessment nor have the funds to hire consultants to carry out the work? Oh, did you already answer that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. I think, I think that might be. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think that that is all the questions that I'm seeing, unless anybody's got a last one. Last 11th hour submission. I don't see any other questions either. Um, thank you both, Ryan and Amanda, for doing such an excellent job of addressing them and um, for each taking turns in addressing them um, during the presentation itself. Uh, as I mentioned before, if people have other questions that come up when we're uh, once we finish up with our program here, feel free to reach out or continue the conversation on the Connecting to Collections forum. Um, I know we're all really very excited about this program, and um, thank you both. Amanda and Ryan for taking the time to um, to share what you've done so far with us. Thank you so, so I think much. We're going to go ahead and coming and listening. <laughs> Thanks. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up today's program. Um, I wanted to just say um, thank you to everyone who joined us, and uh, a recording of the webinar and our related resources, uh, including the handout that Amanda referenced, will be posted in the online community. And our next and final webinar of 2014 is going to be scheduled for Thursday, November 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern. At that time, we'll be joined by Linda Schmitzfurry, who is the Electronic Records Archivist at the Smithsonian Institution Archives. And Linda will be discussing with us how to deal with digital assets. So we hope you all are able to join us then. Um, but in the meantime, enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>